Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Cyclical Investors Club YouTube channel. My name is Corey Kramer, and I run the Cyclical Investors Club investing group over on Seeking Alpha. Uh, there'll be a link in the description if you're interested in joining over there or on Patreon. Uh, today, we're going to analyze Brown Foreman stock. And um, unlike most of the stocks I've been analyzing lately, this one did not come in by request, but I think it's an important one to look at. Um, in order to see an example of the dynamics of what I think is a pretty um, dangerous um, situation kind of in the stock market. I'm not sure the best way to describe it. I'll describe it as I go through the stock. Um, as always, this is not individual investing advice. Uh, this is just how I analyze stocks and how I think about them as investments. So I've I've tried to, I think there's a thing going on right now. The big theme, I'll just kind of put it out there for everybody, is there's a group of stocks that have a certain characteristic that a lot of um, mostly baby boomers who have been retiring a lot lately find really attractive. And they especially found them attractive when we had 0% interest rates. Um, now, obviously, I'm generalizing, but you'll see when I get into this example um, what I'm talking about. And granted, this is one stock, but I analyze hundreds of stocks, so I, I can see patterns that probably other people that aren't looking at that many individual stocks can see. So I recently wrote my second article warning people about some of the general dangers of the ETF SCHD. Um, which is a dividend ETF, which is a pretty good ETF, but um, these type of dividend stocks have just gotten really overvalued. And I don't think a lot of investors have fully understood the new kind of interest rate environment that we're in. Even if interest rates come down a little bit, they probably aren't going back to zero unless we have a recession or something. So um, I'm going to use this basically as an example to so you can see what the pattern is to look for and to be aware of at the individual stock level. Um, because I think really that's where you have to look. And then when you see that and you look at enough stocks and then you look at kind of the type of stocks that some of the dividend ETFs that, are, that haven't done poorly yet, um, like SEHD, you can see that there's a danger of this type of thing happening. Um, so this one isn't specific. This is a little different than one that might be in that ETF, but this is a good example overall. And the only reason I say that is because I don't think the dividend yield is super high. Yeah, it's only a 1.45%. But the dividend yield on a lot of the dividend ETFs are only 2 or 3%. So almost all of them are, unless they're super high yield and low quality, they're almost all less than 4%. So this would be kind of on the edge of fitting into some of those, but it would definitely fit into others because they paid a dividend for a very long time. Um, so let's, let's just get into it. And I'll, the first thing I want to talk about is valuations matter. Valuations are not market timing. Um, they can be for some stocks if they're cyclical, which is what I specialize in, but I picked one specifically that what isn't cyclical. So if you look at the earnings, they just gradually go up over time. They're very steady. That's the dark green area here, the orange line. Um, and then they all they kind of always pay a dividend. And if they have like a really good year, they'll put out like a special dividend, it looks like. That's the white line here. Uh, so this isn't like a cyclical thing, and which makes it a lot easier to analyze and kind of show what's happening with stocks like this. So Brown Foreman, they um, are a spirits and alcohol um, producer. I think uh, Jack Daniels is one of their main brands. I might have to double check that, but they have a bunch of brands and they make their alcohol basically. So <clears throat> um, I wrote, let's look at what I've written on them in the past so we can see here. So I've written tw two articles on these guys in the past. Well, the first one was over four years ago. So the first thing to know with valuations is it, if, you, if you're using earnings, it takes, it can take a long time for the market to sometimes revert to what the earnings are actually doing. Um, but as time goes on, there, the correlation between earnings and price and valuation 
um, gets more correlated. So that's why analysts who have price targets, it's, price targets are just totally stupid. I don't know how to put it any other way. Basically, they look at the earnings over a quarter and then they try to tell you what the price target's gonna be 12 months from now. And that's just not how valuations work. That's why their price targets are always wrong. It's just, they shouldn't even put them out. They should look at earnings. They, they can try to predict the earnings, but the price targets are ri totally ridiculous. It's just, it's garbage. I don't know how else to like, I have a video here somewhere that I made a long time ago about it. But the point is it can take several years until the market kind of recognizes and um, fully correlates the earnings trend with the price trend sometimes. Um, usually it doesn't take that long, but in some cases it can take like 10 years. Um, if you get, if you think of some stocks like a GE in the 2000s when there was just so much hype, um, you know, it took another 10 years for it to really match its actual, you know, Coca-Cola was the same back then. Um, it can take a long time for the earnings to kind of catch up and the price to come down sometimes to a reasonable level. Uh, Microsoft was another good example back then. Um, so we're in kind of another one of these cycles. Now, so when I wrote about it pre-COVID, four, over four years ago, we've now had enough time to kind of see what's happened here. So, and the reason I kind of hammering home so much on these type of stocks this year is because they can be a little bit sneaky, right? So the stock, if you have, if you owned it the last, like f going on five years now or over four years, you're, you've lost about 10% if you include the dividend. Okay. Well, that doesn't sound too bad until you look and you see, well, the S and P 500 is up. This doesn't have the dividend. So probably over 50%. So now that like a 60% underperformance or however many thousand basis points that is, um, is not good. And then we consider we've had 20% inflation since then. Um, the value of your stock has actually lost a third of its value in a little over four years, very kind of quietly. Like there's not a ton of fluctuation in the stock price. So it's this slow process that is the reason I've been so vocal about stocks like this is if you have a whole ETF of them, you know, it could be even less volatile, but the returns are still slowly eroding the value of your portfolio. So this was just a basic valuation analysis. And I'll, I'll do one again today. Um, I picked these guys up because they just reported kind of disappointing earnings. I think they were in line, but you know, they just weren't good. I think revenue growth was 1% or something like that. So, um, so we can see that this, I don't put very many strong cells, so that's just how overvalued it was. And the thing is, there's not anything wrong with this business. This is what makes them so tricky. The business is absolutely fine. It's just not growing very fast. So, or I would say probably not growing at all, really in real terms at this point, but back in 2019, it just wasn't growing as fast as people were pricing it for. So I wrote another follow-up article this year I'm going to have to retype this, I think. Yeah. Give me just a second here. We'll pull up the other one. Um, and I kind of point out that this is kind of this baby boomer retirement bubble. And you can see now in this short time period of about a year, it's down about 16% while the S&P 500 is up 15. So I, I did follow this one up with a little bit more timely post-COVID article. Um, so I basically am in spot on with this, but it's been a slow process. So I want to go back to the fast graph and just show people what's happening here. So I'm not sure what the fast graph has as growth. So if we go all the way back to and some of that growth has not happened and probably won't happen. So let's just go to what we actually, okay, 10%. So from 2003 or however far this goes back, they've been they grew about 10% a year. But the stock price and they were priced pretty expensively back then too. They they're the same, right? So the stock price has grown about 11%. But what happened is when we got in here, people were just paying way too much for it. Well, they were paying way too much probably back then, but this first year has a bunch of growth. I can't see it cuz the fast graph 
graph is here. So they, let me shrink so we can see when they slowed down their earnings growth. So they had some fast years here. So once you get to like 2007, they basically haven't been growing as fast. So that might be a better 2007. We'll go to uh, before the pretend numbers that analysts have out. Um, so now this is more realistic, right? We have 5.59% um, earnings growth and the stock price has grown double that almost on a compounded basis. So we have this compression. If you got back to like a normal PE, which would probably, now they get a bonus because they're, they're pretty stable, right? The earnings are pretty stable. But if you just said like a 17 PE was reasonable, um, and then you go to today, where the PE is almost double that, you would say, okay, well, this should probably be priced like half what it is um, to be how it was back at like just a normal level. But what's happened is the PE has expanded from sub 20, we'll call it, up to, I think when I wrote about it in 2019, it was probably pushing 40, you know? So um, a 40 PE on a stock that's growing generously 10% a year. Um, they were really like single digits just doesn't make any sense. And then they haven't had any growth basically hardly at all since then. And it's, but what's happened is we had our COVID boom or whatever. And now you can see the slow decline starting to happen. And that's really what I've been kind of warning people about. This doesn't have today's decline on it yet, which is down like another 10%. So it's gonna be down closer to the bottom. Um, so it's downward trek is continuing and deservedly so because it's just not worth that much money. But here are the things that you need to look at just kind of 50,000 foot view down on these type of profile of these type of stocks. One, usually they're pretty high quality, which this is, they can, they, they basically don't have any down cycles. Like they're really stable. That's the second quality. Um, the third one is people often know the brands. So people know the brands associated with this. And the fourth one is dividends. Now, these guys don't have a very big dividend because the price is so expensive, but they have a very stable and long lasting dividend, right? So that stability and all those things together, when bond yields were zero made you could make a case for it right you could say well we know these guys can raise the price of liquor with inflation they're paying us a one and a half percent dividend and an inflation protected one and a half yield is better than a not inflation protected zero or 0.5 percent yield on bonds and so you can people could justify it then but now you can get five percent for your cash so it just doesn't make any sense and it's really taken the market a little while to realize that now because of the way that i value things i basically always assume like a three percent interest i'm sorry three percent inflation rate um so even when inflation was one percent and rates were zero percent or somewhere you know you could those moved around a little bit after a while I basically always underlying everything that I do, I just assume long-term um, inflation will be 3%. And so I was never willing to kind of pay up the way that other people were um, who were assuming the interest rates and inflation would stay low forever. Um, and that's why I was the one. When I wrote the strong sell article on Seeking Alpha, there had not been ever, I don't think, another sell article written on the stock. I mean... Let's just up until there's some newer ones, but so my first one was written here. Okay. In 2012. So it had been, it had been seven years before somebody had, um, had a sell article on it. So, and part of that's understandable because the stock price kept going up and people are scared to step in and tell people, I mean, if you owned this in 2012, I just picked a random date. And around the time when I was writing about it, which I think was in November here somewhere, 
you know, you've got a 17% kegger and some guy comes along and he writes an article and says it's overvalued. And, you know, who's going to listen to that when they've just been collecting 7% for the seven years in a row or 17% for seven years in a row. So it's understandable, but that's just why you have to know valuations and why you have to kind of do the math. So let's get into it. Let's get into that. So I have a um, approximate um, earnings growth rate of about 5%, 5.36. Um, currently using $2.02 .02 a share in earnings that might come down after this recent report. Uh, that's a PE of 27.10, okay? And then that works out to an earnings yield of 3.42%. So the way I think about this is if I bought the business for $100, it would earn $3.42 a year if you don't count any growth. If you do count that 5% growth, which I do the first year, I pull that forward. Um, on your $100, you would earn $3.60. So I just grow that out. The $3 grows, the $130 doesn't to um, 10 years and you have $146 on your $100 investment. Well, that works out to about a 3.86% 10 year earnings kegger, including the growth. And that's very low. So if, if I assume inflation is 3% long-term, because we're thinking long-term here, and a business is gonna produce only 3.86% return, that's just not very attractive to me. And if I owned it, I would sell it. So when this is under 4%, that's usually a sell. The revenue growth actually looks pretty good. I think this is mostly because of COVID of the recent quarter that I think revenue either shrank or only grew 1%. So they're basically not growing at this point. So this is gonna come down eventually. But the main thing is the long-term earnings growth. It just really isn't there. Like um, given the price, well, the earnings growth is maybe 5%. And I think they forecast four to five percent, if I remember correctly. Now, so this isn't out of line with what the company's saying, but when you combine that with the price that you're paying for it, the actual kegger that you get on the earnings is very low. So even after the stock has fallen, I don't know, fifteen or twenty percent, um, it's still a sell today. Uh, so that's kind of my message here to folks: it would need to fall fifty percent before I would get interested in buying it. And I would buy it if it was cheap enough, but it's just not anywhere close to there. So I don't know, that's a lot to, uh, prob if you haven't been reading and listening to me for the past year or two, um, it's probably a lot to kind of think about. But you can just look at the separation between the price and the earnings that they're actually putting out um, over this time period. As interest rates stayed low, people were just willing to pay more and more for stable earnings for companies that could raise their prices with inflation. Um, and people are just now starting to realize that interest rates might not stay where they're at right now for a long time, but they're not probably going right back to zero without a recession. So the alternatives are, I mean, you can get CDs that are gonna yield you more than 3.8%, right? Um, you could even go out like probably like five years or something now um, and get that, or at least couple of years so it's um it, I, the reason that i keep going over on and on about this is because i think there's still time for investors to go through their portfolios look for stocks like this um really think about the alternatives and because this can still fall 50 percent from here you know or even without a recession it could fall 20 or 30 percent from here and there's no sense to really take that risk when you can just have cash and, and have a, you know, the income, I think, and the stability that people have wanted. You can get that now. All right. Enough of Brown Foreman. Um, I'll probably write a new update article on this one soon, and I'll get back to everybody's requests um, probably tomorrow. Uh, if you guys enjoyed this video or you found it useful, um, give the video a like and subscribe to the channel. I'll see you guys later.